Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Law, Your Money, and You. I'm Roberta Sapphire, an attorney in Sharon, Mass. And this is Rebecca Greenberg, who uh, works with us. Hi. Camille is not here right now. She's on her way. So Rebecca and I are going to do a little introduction. And that's why we got the water in the background, because Rebecca's niece, Gabby, but it's not Gabby Greenberg. What is it? Well, her name is Gabrielle, but she goes by Gabby. What's her last Gabby. name? Greenberg. Oh, it is Greenberg. It so is. there you go. Yeah. Now we know. So it's your brother's daughter. Correct. But they live in Florida while you're in Massachusetts, which is Freezing. interesting. <laughs> and the reason yeah. we have the water is because she is either a senior or a, or a senior plus one in marine biology. Tell, tell us a little bit about her before we have an opportunity to come on. Um, well, my niece, Gabby, is absolutely brilliant. And she is a, I think, fifth year at the University of Miami. And she is studying marine biology. And um, uh, she has other studies as well in other majors she's doing like biology or chemistry or something like that but her main focus is uh, marine biology and now she's focused on art she's she's wow. quite an artist and she's trying to yeah sculpture painting you know just but she Sounds is like really a walrus. <laughs> Sounds like she, a walrus. what's a walrus I don't know. There's a noise in the background, which is funny. People don't oh. realize that you have other noises oh. and uh, that we have to put up with them. But by the time Camille comes on, everything will be straightened right. out and we're going to have Gabby on too. Yeah. Yeah. So, but right now Gabby is um, really studying the interplay between art and um, science and how the two, there's a symbiosis between the two, which fits in with her you know, marine biology background. So, it's very so she's going to be in Florida while we're taping and right. we're just about ready to uh, hear Camille is there and uh, we're going to be at the studio by way of Zoom. And so let's get going right. and Gabby should be on and I'll be on in a different, uh, going to get a different setup and you got to get a different setup. But we're all excited about the marine biology and yeah. this is this is fantastic. and conservation you know ocean conservation yeah uh, at the end we'll see some to. great pictures of underwater that she does right okay so let's, let's i'm roberta sapphire an attorney in massachusetts and hi i'm camille barron i'm a financial coordinator and healthcare advisor also in massachusetts and we have a very interesting guest here today, don't we, Roberta? We sure do. Besides having uh, Becca uh, on with us now, who was our operations manager and very brilliant in her own right, she's been practicing law almost as much as I have. <laughs> and uh, we have with us her lovely niece, Gabrielle Greenberg. Is it Gabrielle or Gabrielle? Gabrielle, but I usually go by Gabby. I was going to say that, Gabby, but you beat me to it. Gabrielle is pretty. So what a gorgeous name. But, but anyway, Gabby is in Florida, right? We're in Massachusetts. Oh, I'm in Miami. Oh, you're in Miami. And uh, my grandson went to the University of Miami, too. But he's in Georgia now. Oh, wow. Georgia. But uh, anyway, we broadcast all over the country, actually all over the world. So let's start, start by telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm technically a fifth year at the University of Miami. I've been studying marine science, biology, and math ever since 2016. But this current academic year, I'm studying visual art as a way to supplement um, my communication in terms of science. What, what is visual art course? Um, so basically I got a scholarship to study um, whatever I wanted for a full year and I wanted to study cinema, painting, sculpting, drawing, um, just to better understand uh, different um, subjects within the academic field. What does that got to do with marine biology everybody wants to know? <laughs> um, a lot of people I 
I've had the pleasure of teaching a lot of people from various ages, from five years old to 50 years old. And the consistent thing is a lot of people like to see things and a lot of people like to experience things. And one of the best ways for people to do that is with art. So when you go to a movie, when you listen to music, when you look at a painting, um, those are all pieces of art that can convey a message that can be used for change. So understanding as a scientist how to use that is a really cool thing that should be looked into and I would like to personally look into. That's fascinating. Well, wait, what was your intention when you started to study marine biology? What is your, what was your, or is your goal as to how you're going to use that? Um, when I started studying marine biology, I knew I wanted to get into conservation work. Originally, I wanted to work in fisheries, but now I'm primarily focused on conservation ecology. So with using visual art, I hope to inspire people emotionally to care about something in, that could be seen as very distant academically. A lot of people feel like they can't get into science because they're not smart enough or they don't know how to do things, but science and specifically the natural sciences are very attainable to everyone in my personal opinion. You live in your world, you live in the environment, so you should be able to understand it and do what you can to protect it. So when I went into marine biology, I wanted to inspire people with my love of science to get them involved in taking care of their environment. And what made it, made you focus on marine biology in particular? I actually, um, I took a marine biology class in my senior year of high school. And up until that point, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, but when I took that class, I was just really inspired with how much we don't know about the ocean and how much we could know because there's so many resources available and every day there are new techniques, there's new machines, there's new apparatuses that can be used to learn new things, understand things better. And the ocean is so vast, but it's in your backyard for some people. And I really love that aspect of the mystery, but also how easily you can attain that knowledge. You realize that probably, I, I don't know how many people in the country don't live near an ocean. And yeah. uh, you're very fortunate on the East Coast. I'm wondering if you had grown up in the desert, if you would have been interested, but maybe you would have. But you have to understand too, most people like from myself, I have no idea what you're talking about. I have no idea what marine biology entails. I have no idea. Uh, about any of this. So you're gonna to have to explain because if I don't know, then a lot of our viewers don't know, or they might know and they might start calling up and saying things that I don't know. But anyway, go ahead, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Camille, ask again, you're doing good. Well, you know what, <clears throat> what excuse me, what this reminds me of a little bit, Gabby, um, we often watch programs like NOVA and these other programs that, that have to do with uh, the universe, because my husband is very much into that. He's he studied physics and he's very into it. Um, and I'm impressed with the way that they can convey something that is so abstract to most of us that they can convey it by using exactly what you're saying. They can convey and and sort of uh, drive home the message in ways that people can relate to when they're watching these programs. And it sounds like that's the same type of goal that you're inspired towards is to be able to communicate that makes people really grasp it. So otherwise, they would have really feel no connection to marine biology, what's underneath the, the ocean there and the, at the bottom of the ocean and everywhere. So it's a really good way to, to help people to understand. Do you ever go down in those uh, things that they show like on TV with people go down and walk around in the bottom of the ocean? Um, I've never done that, but I do scuba dive and I'm hoping to be um, research dive certified by the time I graduate. So I have had experiences going to, I think the deepest I've ever gone is about 40 feet deep and I do free dive sometimes. So I have been able to have the experience of touching the ocean bottom where the light doesn't go oh, that far. Yeah, it's great. Nice. This stuff got to run in your blood because I know Becca is uh, artistic and, and her mother was which would make it your grandmother right Becca her yes. grandmother yeah so 
so you have a lot of it. Like uh, I can't draw or anything, but uh, I mean I can appreciate for that, but I can't draw or anything. But when when did you? You're you're in. This is your fifth year. What is it? A yeah. five year course, or did you get your bachelor's and go on? And 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 what they're also going to ask you is how did the COVID change your plans or help your plans or hurt your plans? Go for it. Yeah. Um, so I actually am technically part of a four year plan, but the University of Miami provides a scholarship for those who apply and are accepted that allows you to study any field or any subject that you haven't had a chance to fully immerse yourself in. Um, and you can either do that for a semester or for a year and it's fully funded by the university like tuition. Oh. Um, so I did that for the visual arts. And so I'm still technically an undergraduate um, per the requirements of the scholarship, but COVID has put a wrench in some things. <laughs> uh, originally, a lot of my courses for this semester were supposed to be in person, like my art classes. Um, unfortunately, my sculpting class has to be virtual, so I have to do sculpting from home, which allows me to get creative in some circumstances, but it also does put some roadblocks in the way. Um, and outside of school, this past summer, I was supposed to go to Rutgers for a two week fisheries course, um, but that got postponed because of coronavirus. And then I also received an offer for a job at the Miami-Dade sea turtle uh, monitoring program this summer, but I had to turn that down because I um, was more susceptible to the virus than others. So out of health concerns, I had to rescind the offer. Uh, so yeah, and then it's also very difficult for me to plan for the future because luckily there is news of a wonderful um, vaccine that's come out yes. and it could hopefully be as accessible as late November for some, but even then the numbers of how much they can produce aren't enough for, I think even just the United States. So there are concerns with how I should approach the next year or so, depending on how this turns out. So it's hard to plan for the short term in some cases. I, I have a question on the sculpting because uh, I have a nephew who does sculpting. He's from Brazil, but we also have a tenant who says his wife's a sculpture, but the he asked about her using the garage, except it makes a lot of noise and a lot of dust. So is what type, is that what you do? Do you make dust and noise and uh, uh, what is that? I don't make very much noise. Usually the only noise I make is the music I'm listening to, but there is a lot of dust and a lot of things flying. I did a wire sculpture and there were just pieces of wire all over the place. So after every piece, I have to clean my whole room or clean my whole living room, depending on where I was working. Yeah, interesting, yeah, interesting. Do they, do they, when you get a scholarship, do they give you a room and board scholarship too? Um, for the plus one scholarship, which was the one I um, received, it only covers tuition, um, but I already lived off campus with my family, so I wasn't concerned about room or board. What's a plus one as opposed to it's, the four years bachelor's? What's a plus one? A plus one is the scholarship that the University of Miami gives out to students in order for them to pursue other fields of academic study that they haven't had the opportunity to fully um, immerse themselves in during their time at college. So is it like plus one more year? Is that kind of where yes. it comes from? It's like plus one more year or plus one more semester. A lot of students use the time that they're given or the money from that scholarship that they're given to study abroad or to just try something that they've never tried before. Um, and it's really, it's really nice. It basically gives you a little give room before you graduate so you can have a fully immersive experience in what you want to study in college. How important is it that that plus one field of study relate to your primary um, major? So, <laughs> A lot of people when I applied for it were kind of confused because um, my friends, they were all marine biology or marine science and they were ready to graduate. And I 
kind of went the opposite route. I was like, no, I'm going to stay another year and I'm going to study completely opposite of my field because I had never taken a humanities class since I was at the university, since I was in the honors program. The honors program at the university allows you to just speed through all of the courses. So you only take courses that pertain to your majors. So I had never taken a history class, never taken an uh, art class, an English class, none of those classes. So this year I wanted to do as much as I could of those. So whenever I talk about the classes I'm taking with my advisor, he thinks about it in terms of the project that I'm currently working on him with, which is a model basically showing the relationship between algae and coral in terms of um, competition. So he is like, oh, we can model this and then we can create a display that's like a sculpture for you to do or something along those lines, trying to marry those mm. two. Um, but they're not on the surface level, they're very unrelated. But if you look for the deeper meanings, which is in science, the type of science I want to do, it's getting people involved in their environment. And then with art, it's usually a call to action. So if you think of it in that way, they're both very connected and reliant on each other. So you're looking to teach in the end or, or do uh, research or, or just not get a um, job? <laughs> we'll see how things turn out. Um, ideally though, uh, I'm hoping to take a gap year after I graduate. Um, I applied for a Fulbright. Hopefully I get it, I'm not sure. Um, but I'll either take gap year and do research or internships or just get some more experience in the lab and in the field. And then after that, hopefully I will get into a PhD program. Uh, ideally, what I want to do research. What does a Fulbright scholarship cover? What does a Fulbright scholarship cover? Oh, um, the Fulbright scholarship is a national scholarship that basically allows a student or postgraduate or a graduate or just an independent academic to go to an international country and basically be an international liaison. So for my project, I wanna do a survey of sea cucumbers in Fiji because they're a very important export as well as important for the environment. So um, with that scholarship, they provide um, basically room board. They just provide you an amount of money for you to be able to accomplish your project and your goal. And then the- um, presumption is once you return to the United States, you are from that point on a liaison between Fiji and the United States or whichever country you end up going to. It's, I believe it's part of the, um, I can't remember which government department, but it's part of like the government's um, means of foreign diplomacy. You're wonderful. That sounds, sounds fantastic. <laughs> Opportunity. When do you find out? Hopefully I find out in January, but um, it's very, it's a very prestigious award. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's one of those things where if you don't hear back, then you just don't get it. Um, so hopefully I hear back and Well, don't an forget they might have uh, got your email wrong or something wrong. <laughs> you should always, you should always say, I'm just checking to see if you sent me something. Yep, that's always an option. <laughs> Gabby. Um, you know, we, we are exposed a lot to the issues around climate change and the impact on the environment above sea level mostly, but can you tell us what people need to understand about below the sea level and what some of the implications are there that could also affect our environment? Um, so here in Miami, a lot of people have considered it to be the future Atlantis because it is the majority at or below sea level. And one of the bigger issues um, in my eyes is um, gentrification that will be the result of climate change. So a lot of the people that live in Miami live on the coast. Um, a very prominent neighborhood is Brickell. It's very wealthy, lots of sky rises and high rises and very um, top tier elite kind of um, high bank account status. Um, and so as sea levels rise, uh, those people will not necessarily be able to live in those homes comfortably because the coastlines will slowly 
creep in and those beachfront properties will soon become part of the ocean. Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So those people will start to move more inland. And a lot of the people that live inland are in the lower income neighborhoods. So as the higher um, as the higher earners come inward, um, the people that live inland may be pushed out. So that's one issue. Um, one more specific issue to Miami is a lot of old homes run on the septic tank system. So as saltwater intrusion occurs, those become ticking time bombs. They can just go off and destroy the water table. Oh as well in Florida in general, uh, we're built up on limestone, which is a porous rock. Um, and with saltwater intrusion, that's essentially when the sea level rises and it slowly goes underneath the pores and slowly filters through into our fresh water that we use. And the fresh water is from our aquifers and that's where the majority of us get the drinking water that we have. So as soon as saltwater intrusion occurs, that threatens your water supply. So oh. it's, it's really a multifaceted issue and there's so many more things that I can talk about in terms of sea level rise, just sea level rise, not even pollution or ocean acidification or things of that nature. You went to but, all that stuff. I mean, it's been yeah. interrupting. I mean, I mean, she's got a resume <laughs> here, two pages long. Could be more if we use bigger type. <laughs> That's fascinating. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So I saw <laughs> something on your resume about um, marine rescue. Have you done any of that? Um, I haven't been able to go to an actual um, marine mammal rescue, but I have been certified and advanced certified in marine mammal rescue and stranding training. And what does that entail? So um, there are some species of marine mammals, such as um, cetaceans, like dolphins and whales that do come to Florida, either um, for migration, like seasonal or year round. And sometimes because of storms or um, human action or things of that nature, they can get beached along the shoreline. So my certification essentially allows me to be a first responder if necessary, which usually doesn't occur because there are people that are professionals who those are their jobs. Um, but basically I'm backup first responder in case of those situations. So if you a beach a dolphin- lot about beach whales. Yeah, beach whales are not super common in Florida, but they do happen from time to time. It's usually more of the beach dolphin that um, happens here in South Florida. Well, we have around here quite a bit. Maybe yeah. we do here too, is the sharks. More and more. We don't sharks. have a lot of sharks. sharks. Coming closer to the shore. Do you have yeah. any idea why that's happening? Um, I personally don't know. I know that for some of the sharks, they do a really cool technique where they kind of come up on shore and like they school the fish almost so that way they can grab them really quickly. But to my knowledge here in South Florida, we don't have a lot of sharks that come too close to shore just because a lot of the, the prey that they have, if anything, they're about probably 20 feet out from the coastline. So that way they don't really need to come that close inshore, but a lot of more of the dolphins and cetaceans, they come a little bit more closer inshore in order to get their prey or to um, How did you get interested? Behaviors. How did you get, I'm um, interrupting, sorry. How did you get interested in marine biology? Is it because of where you live or, uh, or how? I, I mean, we don't know many people that are into this, but you think there would be, this is so fascinating. Yeah. Um, I think it was a combination of me just going to the beach a lot when I was a little kid. My mom loved the beach. And so whenever we came to Miami for a summer, we'd always go to the beach. Um, but also just as you said, it's so fascinating. A lot of the things that I've learned are specific to a tropical environment, but even in a tropical environment, which is around the equator, there's so much variation in the life, in the habitat structure and everything. And it's just so interesting how everything works together and also how things change over time. So really, I, I pride myself on 
being very curious and being interested in learning and understanding more. So marine biology really allows me to kind of have a structure and a thing to focus on for me to be curious about. So I can learn about sharks one day or whales one day or sea turtles or plankton or seagrass and all of these different things. And they all work together and live together. And it's really fascinating. How are your courses given right, with Zoom? And are you able to see, get together with other students or is everything separated? Um, for some people, it is very separated. There are some who only do online classes, so they stay at home. Um, and then there are some that are fully on campus and taking classes. About half of the classes at the university currently are fully online. The other half are in person or a hybrid. So one week in person, one week um, online. Um, but there still are opportunities for people to socialize in person. I work at a restaurant on campus and that is kind of one of the cultural hubs of the University of Miami. So if ever people want to hang out or relax or spend some time in person together, they'll usually come sit outside, sit in one of the gliders, have some food. Um, I know that I've spent time with my friends in person, either doing work or just relaxing, hanging out and watching movies with always the precaution of making sure everyone's okay health-wise and prepared and all of those things. Did they have a mask policy there in Florida? I, I think I, I heard that they were more open. They didn't shut down the state like they have in Massachusetts. Arizona, I yes. understand. No, not Arizona. California with one of my kids is they said they're now purple, which is worse than red. I don't know what they have. I'm not Florida. sure. Really? I'm not sure what the current status of Florida is, but I do know that we are in stage three of opening, which basically means we are almost, almost all businesses are fully open for business now, which is very concerning for me. I still don't really go out that much, um, but there isn't really, in some areas, there is a mask mandate, but for the greater state of Florida, I believe that that mandate has been removed slightly or at least mildly um, less enforced. But the University of Miami makes us wear masks consistently and they have um, monitors to make sure everyone's wearing their masks, so. You know, I might be wrong, but I think we're at the end of our half hour. <laughs> Uh, but it seems like we just started. Yeah, we are approaching the end, you're right. Yeah, so... Camille, well, you know what I think of when you speak about this? I'm sorry, um, Gabby. When my daughter was little, it was constantly on. Back back in the days, we, we would have the uh, the videos that we plug in, you know, we plug into the, uh, the TV. Constantly, The Little Mermaid and Under the Sea. <laughs> under the sea, Ariel, and we had little oh, yeah. mermaid dolls all over the house. So, uh, so you know, that's a great example of uh, people, children being able to really see, uh, not that mermaids really are yeah. there, uh, or maybe they are, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's, that's a wrap. Thank you so much. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank it was you so great so to much. see you. It's absolutely fascinating. There's tons of more questions. I, I, we have to go, although I don't want to thank you, Becca, for bringing your beautiful niece to us. Yes, thank you very thank much. Thank you. And Gabby, I'm happy she wanted to be on. Thank you, Gabby. I'm very intrigued now by what you had to say. You've kind of given us a little bit of a, a taste, and now we want more. It's quite yeah. fascinating. And, the uh, most important thing is, um, I always encourage this, do your own research. I know it's difficult. There's a lot of misinformation out there, but the number one thing that you can do now is do your own research and spread the word about things that are important to you and your community when you can. What a great message right. and, on, and message. On. wonderful message. Thank you again for being here and thank you to our viewers for watching this fascinating show. If you have any other ideas about topics or if you'd like more information on this topic, please let us hear from you. Because remember, this is your show, The Law uh, and, you. and You. And You, and You, and You. And you.